welcome back everybody to cherry picking we're on episode 43 here up the cherries in all departments now before we do get going please hit the subscribe the bell button below and also um do give this video a like it helps to make this channel grow that rhymes doesn't it um but i have got my main man next to me um his camera's not on at the moment but he is here we have got manny how you doing manny all good, thank you very much indeed, Craig. And I should apologize to everyone who's watching. It often happens when, um, you know, sometimes my my camera gets a bit fuzzy and you can't see me clearly. At least you see this uh, somewhat um, awkwardly pixelated photo of yours truly. But I am here and I'm looking forward to doing some cherry picking because it has been too long. Uh, fair enough, mate. Fair enough. And it's good to have you back. And we've got some exciting, exciting news that will be coming up uh, very, very soon on this channel. So keep your eyes and ears peeled. And to do that, you have to subscribe. Or if you're listening on Spotify, just make sure you follow us. So where better to start than our two recent performances? So on Saturday, we played Everton at Dean Court in a 2-1 win. Um, some may call it fortune, fortune, uh, what's the word? Fortuitous, uh, that's the one I was looking for. Um, but then we played at Crystal Palace and again, got a win, 1-0 uh, victory against the Eagles. Um, Manny, st starting off, uh, we're in great form, aren't we? But from what you've seen of us, do you feel that, really we warrant that is it a case that you know we have been a little bit lucky um like we were against everton to get the three points you know something mr beasley in this premiership right now where there are dodgy results left right and center there is no such thing as being good value for your victory as long as you score more goals than your opposition, you've earned your victory. It's as simple as that. And um, I would go so far to say, having watched um, that video of yours, that in as much as there are some concerns about, the, um, about some of your players, and rightly so, as long as you are able to um, show enough um, desire to get the result, you've pretty much um, been rewarded in many ways. Now, it's interesting, of course, that you um, asked these um, two questions. Um, I would say though that um, it, it might be it might be some something that might know we might not have said in earlier episodes of cherry picking, but the way this season has gone, it could very well be that the decision to um, uh, send Gary O'Neill on his way and bring Iriola in after a very tough period where you were one of the uh, biggest um, skeptics, and um, you know at least you've been willing to admit that you were wrong um, in, in the way things have been going, you know. You are currently on 41 points. Uh, mm -hmm. Technically, technically, I should say, um, with quotations, not safe from relegation. But, um, you know, the way things have been going with Forrest um, uh, having a point seduction along with Everton, with Luton also, you know, struggling, and um, Burnley and Sheffield United looking more and more like they're going to be cast away. Um, you know, you shouldn't even worry about relegation. But the way... Um, Iriola's gotten the tune out of you lot. I also don't see you going through the same uh, sharp drop in form that eventually cost um, Gary O'Neill his job. And um, as far as uh, Europe is concerned, I think Mark McAdam said it perfectly in your video that that mm. could um, prove to be a bit of a burden in the long run. And we will, of course, um, talk about that more specifically. But if you are able to um, keep the results coming in, um, you know, a top half finish, um, it could uh potentially eclipse some um, almost anything accomplished by sir eddie and speaking of which um, do you remember the highest position you were in under eddie howe yes yep ninth ninth so yep. um we finished ninth uh that was in the second season we were in the premier league pretty good wonderful Wonderful, wonderful. So um, I certainly don't see why, you know, you can't um, um, build on that, try and go a little bit further and uh, see how far you go. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I, every position is a substantial amount of money, like Mark did say in the video. And that is why I did feel 
and this is probably a little bit of a criticism at Gary O'Neill, towards the end of last season, he kind of took his foot off the gas a little bit. It was a case of, look, we've done the job. To be honest, Everton did it for us in the end by getting beat by Manchester City. You know, (laughs) no fault of their own. If it was, you know, somebody else, you could say, well, they've let their fans down there. But, you know, against Man City, they beat most teams. But, to be perfectly honest, I think, you know, after that point, you know, we had four games. You know, the Crystal Palace game in particular was very, very poor. The Everton game, I think that we did give, you know, a little bit of a count of ourselves. The Manchester United game, a little bit. But, you know, if we were still scrapping for points after that Leeds match, I think we would have found a little bit more in the tank. We would have found a little bit more, you know, impetus about us. I think we would have got more points out of those four games rather than big fat zero. So, yeah, I think it was a disappointing end. But Iriola has already said, you know, he's not going to do that. You know, his aim is to get us to finish as high as possible. And that Everton game, to go back to that, you know, the most recent one, of course, on Saturday, you know, we took a, you know, decent lead, um, you know, Solanke, um, fantastic, fantastic header, um, you know, and Lloyd Kelly, of course, is coming back into, you know, into the squad. And I think he's been excellent, you know, since he has. Um, one thing I did mention in my video about you know, the Everton game, was Neto's decision-making. Now, he's not commanding this box very well, is he? Let's be fair. You know, he should have come and should have dictated, you know, who was going to collect that ball. Would you agree, Manny? Yeah, I see that goal. And it was amazing, really, how Mm. that uh, game proved to be the tale of the calamitous captains. Um, Neto from your your lot and obviously a Coleman with that um, absolute um, moment of, um, for want of a nicer word, mental flatulence, really. Mm. Or maybe was that just fear? I don't know. You'd think that for a bloke who's earned 70 caps for his country, been their Mm. longtime captain, um, he'd... uh, know a little bit better as to what to do and he'd um, really be more switched on in a situation like that. As far as Neto is concerned, you know, it's easy to say that Neto should have dictated um, uh, the course of play, but when you have a situation where Mepham is um, rather close to the defender, you know, sometimes it is easy for a goalkeeper to get caught in two minds and the thing about Neto is that there is a reason why he was all—he was always a backup goalkeeper and very rarely a first-choice goalkeeper. In that, sometimes when you, if you know that you've been a first-choice goalkeeper all your life, you've got the confidence, you've got the authority, you've—you um, know how to handle it. And I firmly believe that the best goalkeeper in the Premiership, with regard to claiming crosses and high balls, is none other than, of course, the world champion Emiliano Martinez. And I don't yeah. know if you. You might, I don't know if you're necessarily an admirer of the bloke, but um, the thing about him is that he stands six foot five. He's a lot more muscular than um, your Brazilian captain. And he has obviously learned to be a lot more authoritative during his loan spells while he was at Arsenal and also um, during the, those um, what final few games with Arsenal where he helped us win the FA Cup in 2020. And then, of course, ever since moving to Aston Villa, he's become terrific. And there are a lot of peop- uh, fans who are only too willing to sneer at him, mostly bitter Arsenal fans who think that he should have stayed to fight for his place and be a good little boy and shown some class and all that rubbish. But he's blossomed really under Aston Villa, first under Neil Cutler, and then under the new goalkeeping coach. He's um, also developed his game more into becoming the perfect all-round goalkeeper who's also improved his play from the back and the perfect sweep- sweeper keeper. But without digressing, he dominates um, in the air and always makes it very clear that he has to um, get get the ball. He takes responsibility and ownership. David Seaman was also like that um, for Arsenal. With Neto, I think the problem with him is that 
we have we joke a lot about how some of our players like Fabio Vieira need to get some more meat on their bones, quite literally. Maybe they should do the Gary Lineker diet and eat nothing but steak and milk until they tip the uh, scales at um, you know twelve to fourteen stone yeah. or preferably higher. And given that Neto is Brazilian, he should be a fan of their famous churrasco or Brazilian barbecue. And believe me, I've tried it; it's delicious. Make yeah. sure you put the castor powder on. I think. He when he came in after Mark Tra uh, Travers's um you know um, soul destroying um day at Anfield where where you lot lost nine nil obviously as you mentioned Travers's confidence was so shattered he hasn't quite been able to come back into the team Neto obviously when he when he came in then he was performing very well and you know he was justifying his place in the team I think what's the issue here Craig is that maybe it could be um what you would say second season blues because. That, of course, was the uh, season where, you know, O'Neill came in after Scott Parker's sacking. And he was, of course, given um, a new contract in lieu of the fine work he did to uh, keep uh, uh, Bournemouth up, only to end up being removed. And that, of course, was the season where Neto came in and really proved his mm -hmm. worth. It's a case of second season blues more than anything else. And there was a point earlier on in the season where he was in even worse form, mind you. I mean, yeah. if you remember some of those games he played, his performances were terrible. And I think Wolves. he was going through he was going through some personal stuff at the time. And <laughs> um, obviously an injury kept him out of the team and the uh, Romanian bloke Radu um, came in and played uh, one or two games. I don't know what's happened to him, though. And I just think... You know, Neto might still be having a few confidence issues, but second season blues are very common um, yeah. in players. Um, if your first season is spectacular, uh, your second season in comparison will be a little bit of a disappointment. And it's how you're able to, you know, overcome all of that and end up becoming a better goalkeeper uh, uh, and playing better that really defines you as a person. And in between some of those mistakes, he has also made some very good saves. So you can't yeah. say that he's completely, um, uh, absolutely rubbish. But his problem, though, is a lack of competition. And with another Bournemouth connection and an Arsenal connection, Aaron Ramsdale had the same situation. Last season, of course, when Arsenal were in the um, title race in the thick of it, we um, had a bunch of games where, you know, we were expected to win. But then to draw the way we did against Southampton... Um, it was absolutely dreadful. He made a disgusting error at the very beginning, and then ex-gunner Theo Walcott came back to our club and broke our hearts. We were 2 nil down at one point. We somehow managed to um, huff and puff our way to um, a 3 all draw after going down 3-1. So... Um, and, and then, of course, and we never we never recovered from that, and the rest is, of course, history. But in that season, we had purchased Matt Turner... Um, as a replacement for Bern Leno. And while Turner didn't do too badly in the uh, cup games that he played, he was also mainly our Europa League goalkeeper. I think he was dropped for the Europa League second leg in the, in the round of 16 against Sporting Lisbon to give Ramsdale a start. And Ramsdale had a horror game where he was lobbed from the halfway line and couldn't save a single penalty as we crashed out of Europe disgracefully. But Ramsdale ended up becoming an ever-present in the league that season because for some reason Mikel Arteta didn't seem to think Turner was ready. And what angered me personally was that Turner wasn't even given a start in our final home season game against Wolves with the title having been decided in the previous game. So that lack of competition can sometimes lead to a bit of complacency amongst um, players because in your case, you had Radu coming in but now I don't know what's happened to him. Is he injured or is he out? Um... I think he's out of favour, really. I, I can't see. I don't think Iriola will, you know, make that permanent sign in, and nor do I really want it him to. You know, I've not. I don't think he's. He's not shone really here. So I think Radu is probably out of the equation. But it's interesting, actually. You mentioned Ramsdale because, of course. At the end of that video um, that I did with regards to the Everton and the Palace games, and we'll come on to the Palace game in a moment, um, somebody, and I won't name I won't name the fan, um, a very good friend, he, he won't thank me for naming him, um, mentioned with regards to Neto and why he might not be coming. And the reason for that is potentially Neil Moss. Now, this isn't Neil Moss's fault. And this isn't Neto's fault. It is a difference in style. What people, what maybe Neto prefers and what Neil Moss prefers. What 
the other coaches are trying to do and get the defence to do, um, as opposed to what Neto want, may, may want to, you know, dictate. And I don't know if you remember when Arta Boric um, was at the club and Neil Moss had just joined, um, there was a point where Boric stayed very much on his line and he looked a little bit shaky at times. Now, Boric was a fantastic goalkeeper. Um, yep. And there is no doubt to me that, you know, Boric, you know, Boric was still performing well. You know, he was doing what he was asked of him, but maybe he wasn't as comfortable with staying on the line. And maybe the defensive coaches and, you know, wanted a little bit more from the defenders. So the defenders making sure that they're clearing their lines rather than the goalkeeper running out. Because we've seen it the other way. Fabian Bartes, probably the best example, where he just rushes out, you know, completely misses it, and it's in the back of the net. And if you do that, it results in a goal. So that's, I can see why Neil Moss might not want Neto to do that, but I can see why Neto might want to command his box a lot more. Um, And to be honest, I think, you know, and... It was a question that was put to me. Did I think that? And to be honest, thinking back, you know, and trying to cast my mind back, I think that it's a very, very good point that maybe Boric suffered from that. Maybe Neto suffering the same because he wants to come for balls rather than stay on his line. What do you, what do you think of that philosophy of theory? You know, if that's the case, really, then... Um then maybe if, if it is um, down to Neil Moss making it crystal clear that Boris has to, that the goalkeeper has to stay on his line the way Boris did and uh, maybe the way Neto's being asked to do, that maybe Neto should be absolved from a little bit of blame. And if that's the case, when you do have crosses coming into the box, it shouldn't just be um, Chris Mepham in there. It should be another defender. Yeah. Um, so you've got to make sure that you've got at least two defenders in that box. If you want to make sure that your goalkeeper stays on the line, you can't isolate the poor bloke in that particular respect. Interesting you mentioned, of course, about the influence of goalkeeping coaches. I mentioned that Martinez was probably at his best when Neil Cutler was at the club. When he left and a new coach came in under, I think, Steve Gerrard's management, um, his form started to um, dip a little bit, but they recovered in time. And, of course, um, the World Cup really helped him get his uh, confidence back. Um goalkeeper of the tournament in that in that as you know and then of course um he also has this um ability to be uh not uh, very resilient he recovers a, a lot from disappointments and make sure make sure that he ends his season on a high note for the most part last season obviously villa qualified for europe by the conference league in this season and we will talk about them specifically they're still very much um in the hunt for champions league football and also could be um one of the teams expected to win the conference league um, Martinez is one of those goalkeepers, um, Craig, who works really hard at his game and really takes into account what they're saying. But um, for the most part, it really helps if the goalkeeping coaches also know their players well enough to really decide, to, to, re- to really accept that the, um, the way a certain goalkeeper uh, keeper plays, that might be the best thing for, th- thing for them. And you can't ask them you can't ask those old dogs to learn new tricks unless you get everyone involved because it's not so much um, the goalkeeper responsible as the entire defensive unit. So um, I actually think there needs to be a bit of a, a chat between Moss and uh, Neto and maybe Iriola to say, you know what, we've got to try and cut down these um, errors. But Neto also has to try and uh, you know be willing to learn. And the defense also has to be in on it because... As I've said, if you want to um, want your goalkeeper to stay on the line, you can't have a situation where the poor bloke is isolated with only one defender in the box. And um, coaches, for the most part, are proactive with trying to improve their goalkeepers. Famously, Peter Schmeichel, despite being six foot four and a really big unit when he came to Manchester United, wasn't exactly the best on corners and high balls. So Ferguson. Alex Ferguson, of course, had um, his um, big, um, tall players um, pounding in on the goalkeeper. High balls were sent into the penalty area, be they through throws or corners or what have you. And uh, that really toughened um, Schmeichel up in a way. But of course, Schmeichel was at the beginning of, of his career. Neto's into his 30s. So it just goes to ask, it just begs the question, 
is it possible for an old dog to learn new tricks? And I actually think that it is possible, but, you know, you've got to make sure that everyone has to be involved. You can't just expect, uh, you know, the dog to be willing to take um, uh, the initiative all by himself. You have to make sure that everyone is really in on it. So, and if I remember correctly, you mentioned that Neto did have a good save from Dominic Calvert-Lewin earlier on in the game. So yep. he's still making some saves. He's just some, um, making some errors in between. But over the course of time, I think the errors will cut down. And the big problem is, if um, Iriola were to decide that Neto needs a bit of competition and gets another goalkeeper in, that begs the question, who ends up becoming captain of Bournemouth? Because Neto is also your captain. Do you just um, yeah. take the captaincy away from him and drop him and hand it to someone like an Adam Smith or a Marcus uh, Tavernier or maybe, um, heaven forbid, uh, someone like a Dominic Solanke, who we don't know would necessarily um, rise to the challenge or really accept the responsibility? So um, I think um, it's a case of just trying to weather out the rest of this, uh, this season and try and uh, make sure that um, the mistakes are gone. And then uh, next season, we, by next season, you can ha um, have a review and uh, decide the best course of action. In any case, I think um, Neto will probably be in the final year of his contract uh, next season. I don't know if he's um, signed a new deal or if he has I don't remember if he signed a new deal to stay at the club for a little bit longer. You might know that better than I do. But um, it will come to pass that there will be need for some competition, in which case I expect both Radu and Darren Randolph to leave the club. I don't know what's going to happen with Mark Travers. I think he'll want first-team football to try and challenge uh, Gavin Bazuna and Quevin Kelleher for the Ireland jersey. So yeah. um, I'd say just... Um, you know, let things take their course with Neto and he'll he'll work on his game. He's an honest professional, really um, top bloke. And obviously everyone still adores him over at Dean Court. So all I can say is just don't be so quick to throw the baby out with the bathwater. No, I completely agree. And I think you've made some really good points. I don't think Radu or Randolph are going to be in contention at all. And Travers will want first team football somewhere uh so whether or not that be dropping into the championship who knows um he might be able to get a side in the premier league and do what ramsdale has done um but it's a very very good point if we do take neto out of goal and put travers in firstly i don't think travers is a captain who do we give it to adam smith um, of course, Max Ahrens has been bought in as a natural replacement for Adam Smith. And I think Smithy, you know, as reliable as he has been this season, isn't getting any younger. So eventually, you know, do we give him the captain's armband for a season? May it be a case that he is a bit of a bit part player next season, you know, which is a bit harsh, me saying that, but at the same time, unfortunately age is against all of us and therefore you know it might be a case of we need to give it somebody younger tavernier is a good suggestion um the man i'd actually like to give it to and the man that played very very well and the man that we need to try and keep hold of you know where this is going lloyd kelly um i thought was fantastic against everton i think he was fantastic against crystal palace as well He was captain, though, before being replaced. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And uh, I remember you saying in the video, Craig, that um, it could very well be that Lloyd Kelly also might consider moving on. Maybe that a yep. change could prove to be um, what he needs, which is a shame because, you know, he's in his mid-20s. He's 25. So yep. you would think that, you know, he could go on to enjoy uh, some really good years at Bournemouth and become um, a real bona fide um, legend at the club. But if it is um, true that the likes of Newcastle and Tottenham want him and maybe he feels that he needs to um, move on and um, obviously uh, both of those clubs are in a in financially a decent position to offer him some money, although we will talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, I would... Um, I'd also be hesitant to maybe give it to him. Kelly now has to has the, um, the responsibility of nailing back his first team place. And you said you mentioned your concerns about Adam Smith not um, necessarily being a starter next season. Lloyd Kelly's um, 
superb position in the team is also every bit as tenuous, I would say, with the likes yeah. of Zabani and um, Mepham and Kirkies and a few other players. So, um, ideally, Kelly should be very much in front and center in your team's uh, team's planning next season and the fact that he isn't as of yet is really saddening news it could very well be that the best um, decision for um, all parties concerned is that he ends up um, leaving the club which would be a very big shame because um, you know he is still a talented defender and seeing him lose the captaincy like that would have really hurt him but he rose to it um, um, uh, wonderfully well and really worked hard and um I mean, if he does end up staying at the club long term, then you've got your captaincy problem, problem solved right there, I would say. But, um, yeah. you know, as we all know, things don't always work out the way um, you plan it. We propose and circumstances dispose, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think one thing for Lloyd Kelly is, and to be honest, Adam Smith come out and mentioned it recently is the amount of flack and abuse that the players have had. Um, and I remember Lloyd Kelly, you know, don't get me wrong. I criticized and said that it was poor performance that he maybe needed to be dropped at that point. But, you know, I always admitted that he was a very, very good quality player. Um, the thing is, is of course, some of our fan base have gone, as we saw with Gary O'Neill, OTT over the top, yep. and therefore have effectively made some people's minds up for them. Unfortunately, because you can't tell you can't tell me that. Say, for example, let's look at what happened at Everton last season, and seeing as we played Everton recently. Um, people chasing cars and speaking to Anthony Gordon and people like that on the street. If a move comes up for a player and they've been approached in that way or they've been treated a particular way, they may think, well, you know what? I do want this fresh start. It might have that. And I've never understood fans knocking and abusing their own players and as we saw with Gary O'Neill manager you know criticized by all means say that wasn't particularly a good performance I'm sure Iriola does that to the players or the uh, have let them down each week but you know there's a there's a fine line and what I think a lot of fans forget are these players are human beings absolutely absolutely managers are human beings too yeah, And it's never going to be nice, obviously, when players are abused. But let's also not forget that given Lloyd Kelly's um, youth and the fact that um, I think now, of course, he's 25. He's probably been with the club uh, since he was um, probably probably just broken into his 20s, I guess. So mm -hmm. as a young guy, you know, um, he'd, uh, he'd have felt the abuse very badly. Some of the more older professionals would be, you know, for them, it would be like water off a duck's back, if you, as it were. So abuse is still a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, for fans to sort of go over the top in their abuse of players, it isn't really the best thing to do. But at the end of the day, there's a reason why I often say that nothing succeeds like success. We have our share of fans, Craig, obviously at Arsenal, who absolutely adore Mikel Arteta and believe that, um, you know, everything he touches turns to gold. And you've got some section of fans like yours truly who do not like the manager and who think that um, he's tactically um, clueless at times, intellectually arrogant or what have you. I don't mean to, you know, go in on him necessarily, but um, the best way to sort of shut fans up and unite fans behind play a team, a players and manager is for the team to be successful. And now, of course, and as I say that you're in a situation where you've got 41 points with about, um, say, half a dozen or thereabouts some um, games to play. So if you are able to secure about um, uh, maybe nine or 12 points and get to somewhere around about like above 50 or even finish, uh, finish higher than ninth, um, which is what Eddie Howe was able to um, accomplish. I think uh, McAdam was being a little bit, um, you know, pessimistic in a way when he said that uh, he hoped that you lot would finish 12th and then maybe go up to 11th and maybe take it from there. 
but um, maybe that would have something to do with your running. I mean, you do have to face the likes mm. of Aston Villa. You've got to face us. You've got to face... Um, I don't know if you've got Liverpool up again in your... Um, no, we've got Manchester uh, United. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and they're going to be um, eager to avenge that uh, shellacking they got at Old Trafford. Believe you me. Oh, I enjoyed so, that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did, mate. So um, I think if you can secure a good number of points, um, you should you should be able to um, have a high finish. And then that could possibly end up uniting all the fans behind the team. Because at the end of the day, even though um, fans of clubs will disagree on on the steps that are being taken, everyone agrees that at the end of the day, we all want the club to succeed. I want Arsenal to be successful this season. I want us to try to win the league, and I don't know if that will necessarily happen with um, Liverpool currently um, ahead of us as it stands. I know we got back on top after, um, you know, beating Luton Town, but the fact that we only beat them 2-0 and Liverpool are playing Sheffield United... I expect Liverpool to pump uh, the blades for a few goals to wipe out um, the huge advantage that we've had in goal difference. If we if we can win the league, I will support the manager. But um, again, it's success that determines everything. And if Bournemouth finish higher in the season, then maybe the fans will unite and say, you know what, we do have a great t- t- a special team. We've got special players and a fine manager. And it just goes to show that all those um, fans who were saying, trust the process, back Iriola, have been mm-hmm. proved right. But again, you're only as good as your next game or your next season. But this season, if you can finish higher, expect the abuse to completely um, cease, at least for now. A ceasefire, if you will. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, You know, I'll hold my hands up. I said earlier on in the season about Iriola, I was completely wrong. And I said about Jesse Marsh, I know that I've got a bit of stick for that. Um, But hey-ho, it was where we was at the time and what I actually thought. And to be honest, I'm so chuffed that I was proved wrong. But I tell you what, let me go on to another point. Um, And... Of course, he's going back to the goalkeeper situation. But, you know, I said earlier on about with regards to somebody I was talking to at football on Tuesday at the Crystal Palace match, um, also made another suggestion, and I didn't put this in the video. And that is, who could we get in next season as either a backup goalkeeper or somebody to come in as the main goalkeeper. And the first name that was brought up by this gentleman, again, won't name him, was Rambo. Could we have a Rambo's return? It might sound um, very tempting, but... uh... The biggest problem with trying to get someone like Aaron back at the club is that having had a taste of life um, in the big time, um, being at a club like Arsenal, to go back to Bournemouth maybe would be um, considered a little bit of a step down and maybe he wants to have a bigger challenge. It's uh, yeah. more likely that um, Sir Eddie will want to see him as um, you know, competition for um, competition with um, Nick Pope because... Martin Dubravka, as you know, has um, deputized for Nick ever since he sustained that horrible shoulder injury. And the thing about Dubravka is that although he's made some excellent saves this season and some of his performances have been good, he hasn't kept too many clean sheets. He was very unfortunate to have been denied a clean sheet when Newcastle played Everton. Um, He obviously got a hand to um, Dominic Calvert-Lewin's penalty, but couldn't stop it from going off his hand into the net. Otherwise, he would have had a clean sheet. And um, there is something about Dubravka that uh, maybe um, Howe doesn't really like. And when um, Pope was in the team, he was obviously, you know, very dominant on crosses. But um, Dubravka obviously has the uh, little matter of um, being Slovakia's first choice goalkeeper at the upcoming Euros. So he knows that um, even though even if his uh, season hasn't exactly gone to plan with Newcastle, he has a lot to be grateful for. Um, internationally and personally and it could very well be that if he has a great um, Euros with Slovakia he could be on the move and there would be um, no shortage of clubs being willing to try and uh, get his signature so 
Debraca leaves, Ramsdale ends up going to St. James's Park, and uh, that could pretty much um, solve uh, some problems right there. If Ramsdale were to come back, it would be a hard sell to try and get him back because um, hmm. let's also not forget that when he was promoted to the first team and uh, Boris was um, in the final year of his contract, and he ended up occupying the bench for literally the entire season, which I thought was very harsh. Ramsdale, of course, was the goalkeeper when you lot got relegated. And although yeah. I understand that um, a large number of Cherries fans will have fond memories of him personally, they probably wouldn't want to... Um, recall a player associated with that particular season which saw Bournemouth um, drop down and have to fight tooth and nail to come back in and uh, it could very well be that um, Ramsdale might view Bournemouth as a stepping stone in his career something for which he is grateful to have had but going back there wouldn't necessarily be the best thing and I'm often reminded of a famous uh, poem by the Irish poet Felix Dennis called never uh never go back uh or something like that i think it's yeah ne uh, or maybe it's never look back i don't know i'll have to look that up and confirm it but um the stanza of course reads um basically that you know you should never ever want um try to go back to places where you've been because you know you uh Yeah, it, it, the poem's called Never Go Back. And um, the, the, the verse reads like this. Never go back, never go back, never surrender that future you've earned. Stick to the track, to the beaten track, and never return to those bridges you've burnt. And although it can be very tempting to try to go back to a former stomping ground, given some of the happy memories you may or may not have had, um, what seems to be apparent is... Um, this maxim that you can't write a new chapter without turning the page. And let's also bear in mind that at one particular point in time, Ramsdale was the most, um, you know, valued goalkeeper in terms of um, the price asked for him. Every single week that he's um, spent on the Arsenal bench has seen his value um, depreciate a little bit further. But it will take, uh, take um, a big struggle to try and sign him. And especially given that Arsenal bought him for about 30 million quid, I'm sure that the club would want to, at the very least, break even. So yeah. do Bournemouth have the finances to afford that? I'm not too sure. And that segues further into that discussion with uh, Mark McAdam on about whether or not you can actually afford to make such big money purchases um, given the way your club has been, has been run and whether or not it would be the most prudent thing to do. So I think it's fair to say that um, Ramsdale might not be um, the answer. One option with a Southampton connection could very well be uh, Gavin Bazunu, yeah. who stayed at Southampton when they got relegated and who has been performing well. But if Southampton do not get um, promoted to the, uh, to the Premier League, He's going to take a look at um, Cuevan Kelleher, who is, in fact, playing for Liverpool tonight, and um, see, see, and see all of that and say, you know what? I want to play premiership football. I love the fact that I'm uh, Ireland's number one goalkeeper ahead of Cuevan, but I need to be playing premiership football. And it could very well be, you know, a move across the South Coast could very well be what I might need. And, that, and he'd end up being another of the uh, list of players who've um, played for both um, South Coast clubs, Southampton and Bournemouth, including, of course, Messrs. Boric and Messrs. Yeah. Moss. So that might be your best option. Um, and also, given that it's a championship club, um, the Ch Southampton are in the championship right now, if um, it does come to pass that um, they might have to let Bazunu go, I'm pretty certain that they're not going to try to hold uh, clubs to ransom to try to get him off their books, especially if Bazunu himself might not want to stick around at um, uh, St. Mary's for too long. So hopefully that should answer your question. He might be one for whom you should um, go. Another one may be uh, Seni Dieng, the uh, Middlesbrough yep. and Senegalese goalkeeper. But my money would be Bazunu. It would be a move of convenience for both parties. Yep, most definitely. The question is, though, and this is probably leading on to the next point, is if Ramsdale did come back, would he actually be coming back to the same sort of side? Because, of course, he left, went Eddie, 
did. Um, you know, of course, he went to Sheffield United. Eddie, you know, took a break away from the game and then ended up at Newcastle. So might it be that going to Newcastle will be effectively the repetition coming to Bournemouth might not be because of un- playing under Iriola. I think he probably would be a perfect goalkeeper to play under Hal Moss, I believe. You know, he's asking the keepers to play. Um, you know, I think it would be, you know, maybe a com- it might it's just a completely different scenario in my head. You know, it's a very different club to when Eddie left. And of course it could be an even more different club if and here we go. Europe. Now, would you say at this point in time, Manny, that Europe would be that poison chalice for AFC Bournemouth? I'll address the Ramsdale issue first and say, yep. you know, you talk about Moss wanting um, the goalkeeper to stay on their line. Mm-hmm. The biggest bugbear that I have with um, Ramsdale during his time at Arsenal is that he never was the best goalkeeper when it came to dealing with crosses and high balls. He'd yeah. always, you know, um, flap and miss more than a few. And um, that was obviously um, seen in full display when we lost to um, Liverpool in the FA Cup. Uh, you know, the goal that was scored from the corner, he went for it, but then Kivior got there first and ended up being a known goal. He doesn't have the ability to truly um, command his defence when it comes to corners either. And so he is obviously a fine shot stopper, but there are so many um, aspects to his game where he, in which he really, really needs to work. And it is imperative that wherever he goes, he takes some of the goalkeeping coach's advice on board. Now, if it, it does come to pass that Moss will enjoy working with Ramsdale and, you know, maybe Ramsdale will respond to Moss's style of coaching, it could work for both parties. I just, um, obviously, for the reasons I've mentioned, I don't see Ramsdale coming back. But if he does come back, then maybe it could be that way. Maybe it could um, prove to be beneficial for both him and the club. It will be a different sort of um, style of play, but maybe the style of play that um, Ramsdale would enjoy. And let's also not forget, under Eddie Howe, Ulock got relegated with Ramsdale in goal. Under Iriola, if Ramsdale were to come back, maybe he'd he'd enjoy a different style of play. So um, it could be um, something that suits both parties. But again, for reasons I've mentioned, I don't see that happening. And as far as Europe is concerned... Um, the best thing that you could possibly hope for would be to qualify for the uh, Europa Conference League or, you know, if fair play comes into it and you finish high enough, maybe you'll end up sneaking into um, uh, the the Europa League. I'm not too sure. Or maybe the par- parameters have changed. Um, the fair play team goes into um, to the Conference League. I really don't know. Would it be a bit of a poison chalice? Well, we've seen how... Brighton have fared this season. They were outstanding in the group um, stages, including beating a Marseille team, which has had the likes of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and others um, playing. And obviously Marseille are quite experienced when it comes to European competition. But when it came to facing a Roma team, and a Roma team which is now, of course, riding the crest of a wave uh, under Daniel De Rossi after sacking Jose Mourinho. I just think they were found uh, completely wanting. And the injuries obviously have taken a bit of their toll and they weren't quite the squad and they were when they faced the Italians home and away and home. And um, you also take a look at a side like Aston Villa. They're actually going great guns in the Conference League. They struggled um, quite badly, losing to Legia Warsaw and um, securing a 1-0 win over... Zrinski Motstar, a name which I can barely spell, leave alone pronounce correctly. I only hope I have <laughs> pronounced it correctly. But since then, they've been pretty much imperious. And when they took on yeah. Jordan Henderson's Ajax, I think they sort of um, managed the game well enough to secure a nil-nil draw at uh, the uh, Johan Cruyff um, Arena. And then when it came to Villa Park, they literally blew them away. And I had the privilege of doing a watch along for that game, and it was quite a joy to behold. But in addition to having that competition, they're also um, fighting for the Champions League. And yet, Aston Villa also had been one of those clubs that um, have seen um, negative, you know, financial 
um, reports. In fact, there was a report on BBC Sport that they had lost um, something in the region of 120 million quid over the last um, year. And it will be interesting to see how they balance their books. It could very well be that despite the potential Champions League revenue that they could get, and also if they win the uh, Europa Conference uh, League, they will, that will go some way to ensuring that five English clubs play in the Champions League next season. It could sadly be that they may have to sell quite a few of their players to balance their books. And as Mark McAdam mentioned, I do believe that the deadline for making player transfers, um, selling or buying, whatever it may be, is the 30th of June. Yes. So Aston Villa have got some decisions to make, although I think um, the wording from that club has pretty much been that, you know, although we may not... um, we may have lost a bit of money. We are still within the acceptable range. And, of course, there will be some other parameters, of course. Um, I think, as mentioned, you won't be allowed to spend more than 85% of your money on, um, you know, um, transfers and other club-related activities or what ha- have you. So um, that is something that could potentially happen. Um, Bournemouth as well, of course, um, in, in contrast, I should say, have been run very well indeed. You've made some smart purchases. You've made sure that your books have been very well balanced. And so you wouldn't necessarily be in that um, bad a situation. My biggest worry is that if you were to go into Europe and you'd want to obviously try and make sure you do as well as you potentially can, you know, would you be tempted to make some purchases uh, just for the purpose of trying to get into um, to, to have a good run in Europe? And some of the purchases you've made this season, including Cloyvert, who I think has been absolutely wonderful since joining Bournemouth. I think he's got a new lease of life since moving down to the South Coast. And it could very well be that he ends up, you know, having a a wonderful second win in his career. career, And he may end up going to achieve some really, really good things. Or it could be that he stays loyal to the Cherries and really continues to blossom. And uh, you do do have um, a decent set of players who can do well in Europe. Bear in mind, of course, you have a section of Welsh internationals who were a part of that team that just um, bravely failed to secure qualification for the Euros, losing, of course, to um, uh, Boritz's um, former compatriots in a penalty shootout. So the only way to stop um, potential European football from being a poison chalice would be if you were to maintain the... um, prudence in your spending and only try and uh, work with free transfers but he, let's also not forget especially in the case of uh, Kylian Mbappe that although a tra- just because a transfer may be free it doesn't mean that you won't be spending too much money far from it if anything the amount that you'll be spending on salaries and other stuff could very well end up uh, making it you know um, a poor investment depending on the player in question so I also don't think given the uh, team's in the mix at present that, um, you know, you could uh, necessarily have a very big chance of qualifying because some of those teams are still really, really good quality teams. You've still got Brighton in the mix. You've got Manchester United very much in the mix. Newcastle and uh, one or two other teams. West Ham, don't forget them. They have a proud, um, I mean, I wouldn't say proud European history, but they love playing European football and they want to continue having a taste of that, believe you me. So... I think um, European football shouldn't be the focus, although if you do manage to have an amazing run between now and the end of the season and the other teams completely fall away, you know, who knows what could happen. But um, while it wouldn't necessarily be a poison chalice, I think that isn't necessarily what you should be focusing on right now. And with that, I agree with Mark. But I would also go so far to say, don't be satisfied with finishing at the top of the bottom half. Try and crack the top half and see how far you can go from there. Exactly, mate. Exactly. Um, You know, I think it would be amazing to see us in Europe, but it's not the be-all and end-all at the moment. We're still growing. And I think, you know, when with the side being and the additions that we need to make, you know, I think we need a strength in depth is the word, really. But... A couple of times there, you made some good points with regards to um, Aston Villa having to sell players. And this brings me on to really the final point for today's cherry picking. And of course, this is what that video with Mark McCadden was all about with regards to profit and sustainability rules. Now, there's been an article and there's been a number of articles that have been bounding around 
Of course, Everton have got a points deduction already, as have Forest. Leicester are going to get one by the looks of things if they get promoted, which at the moment is looking a little bit borderline. What happens if they stay in the EFL? Who knows? Um, Everton are going to potentially get a second points deduction. But then something come out today and this was it. Um, it's been going. It's in been in the Times. It's been in the Manchester Evening News. Is the one that I've actually got open, and it's with regards to the Premier League considering um, a huge FFP points deduction change amid Man City's 115 charges weight. Um, so this was written by Josh Holland and Amy Wilson, and what's basically been put in there is instead of points deductions moving forwards, clubs who are guilty of PSR, breaking PSR, are going to be made to pay a luxury tax. Now, there's two arguments about against this. And firstly is, you know, the one of the first things, you know, and I did bring this up with Mark, is that the top six, of which your side, Arsenal, are one of, um, is feeling a little bit like a closed shop at the moment because clubs like Newcastle, or if Bill Foley decides to go for it, can't break into that. I can see why it's in place, because we don't want situations like Portsmouth, we don't want situations like Sheffield Wednesday, Reading, Wigan, moving forwards. You know, that's something that we need to eradicate. And that's why we've got this independent body. But the second thing is with regards to this, if they do this from next season, firstly, there's going to be uproar at Everton and Forest, especially if one of them are relegated or potentially both, because Burnley aren't in bad form at the moment and they seem to be picking up results. Still, I think they've probably got too much to do, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility that both of them might be relegated at the end of the season. Um, and also, a luxury tax. What is that really going to do to Manchester City? What is that really going to do to Newcastle? Being honest... What is that really going to do to Bill Foley's pocket? What do you reckon, Manny? I think another question that should be asked, Craig, is that if you do, if you were to impose that sort of luxury tax on those um, clubs, let's um, let's make it crystal clear uh, for some of these clubs which um, literally have money to burn, that luxury tax of sorts would literally be, um, you know, um, a penny in the bucket compared to how much they're able to. To, um, make and let's also not forget that ever since um, City's um, financial um, takeover by the um, uh, you know the Mansour family from Abu Dhabi, they've literally enjoyed unprecedented success. And of course, they are the treble winners. Remember when I said that nothing succeeds like success? When you yeah. are um, when you have a club that's winning trophies left, right, and center, you obviously are going to make um, shed loads more money in terms of merchandise um, sales and so forth. So at least that way, you do have the um, have the earning power and the ability to make a lot more money than um, what you would have to spend. And I would definitely go so far to say that if you were to impose a luxury tax, it would be um, it w it really wouldn't be that uh, the, that beneficial. It might have something going for it if it were tied to the um, annual revenue of the clubs in question over a certain period, because. Again, you don't want to have a situation. I'm sure you might be old enough to remember the poll tax. Um, yeah. And now, of course, we're going um, a, a little bit political. And the reason why that flopped and why um, uh, the Maggie was forced to resign, and rightly so, was that every single person, regardless of their income, had to pay the same amount, uh, the same amount of tax or something like that. And you don't want to have a situation where effectively you... Uh, make the poor suffer and the rich um, end up um, being further um, being unaffected. Let's say if um, the revenue of Manchester City was so much more than that of a Manchester United or an Arsenal or even a Tottenham Hotspur, would you still want every single club to um, pay uh, the same amount of um, tax? And given that some of these clubs also have the ability to spend a great deal of money as well, 
don't forget, we sh- we shelled out about 170 million quid on two players, Declan Rice and Kai Havertz. Mm-hmm. Um, again, how do you uh, make that thing work? I do believe that the uh, the idea of a tax would have a lot more going for it if it were, you know, linked to um, the actual revenue that clubs earn, because not all clubs, especially not all clubs in the uh, top echelons of the league, will earn the same revenue. But um, again. It just seems to me that it's a way of trying to get more money to try and um, a- have that act as a substitute for more severe action. And the reason why City have been saved from immediate action is because they've had the means of being able to appeal, while for some reason Everton and Nottingham Forest weren't quite able to do so. And uh, it's unfortunate what's happened to them, but it just goes to show that when you spend well beyond your means and leave um, the balance sheets sheet of your club in you know the red i don't care if red may be your jersey's color and certainly it's certainly not the jersey's color in the case of everton or it may be for nottingham forest but you still can't um financially run a club that way you can't you know um be spendthrifts and bournemouth have learned that lesson very well um mm-hmm. even aston villa obviously when you consider their history you know, recent history. I mean, they obviously had to fight tooth and nail to get back into the Premiership. Under Dean Smith they and Stephen Gerrard, they were solidified as a mid-table team. Under Emery, they've made that push higher to become, you know, a team competing in Europe and potentially um, getting higher honours. I still think that Villa, of course, and briefly digressing, will need to strengthen their squad because they are clearly a first 11 team and a first half team. Their squad... Um, uh, deficiencies were laid bare when they were thrashed by Manchester City last night. Yeah. But um, again, going back to what I was saying, clubs now have a responsibility to spend within their means. And the luxury tax will not really do too much um, good unless you were taxing them, taxing the clubs proportionally regarding the revenue that they've earned. Because it could very, you could have a situation where different um, clubs might earn different revenues every year or over a period of a few years and end up spending similar amounts of money. If they do, then would that tax be beneficial? I'm not too sure. And how much would that um, particular uh, tax be? I don't know if they've really gone to the specifics of that. It just goes to show that when it comes to trying to, you know, um, to arrange a sort of tax, as it were, there are so many parameters with which to deal. And um, it may start off as a luxury tax, but eventually... You know, when it comes to tax, uh, taxing clubs, eventually other clubs will have to, will be forced to fall into that. And, you know, M- Maggie always said that the biggest problem with socialism is that you invariably run out of other people's money. But the biggest problem with capitalism is that in- inevitably you will run out of poor people's money. And eventually it could very well be the smaller clubs that could be forced to try and at least partially subsidize this tax. So, no, I'm not really necessarily in favor of it. There might be people who could disagree with me. I'm willing to hear what they would have to say. And if you, any of you, in fact, do disagree with me, if you're watching this, you are welcome to listen to what I have to say and voice your disagreements with me, and I will be happy to you know, listen to your points. And I love this um, debate. And obviously, as a, a finance graduate, um, debating economics, something that really you know um piques my interest so i just i don't think this luxury tax is really um you know a good idea and i've also mentioned in the article um josh and amy that um anchoring is another idea um a salary cap linked directly to the wage bill of the team that finished last in the premier league um again though we don't know how much um how much those particular clubs would necessarily spend although it would be safe to assume that um, a club like Sheffield United, who look doomed to finish last, will certainly not have had enough money to pay uh, most of their players the big salaries that um, these um, players of big clubs often take for granted. Um, aligning more with UEFA's, restricting spending on wages, transfers and agent fees to a mere 70% of the club's income and not the 85% that was mentioned in that talk you had with Mark McAdam. Yeah. So... I would actually um, like to think that if you were to have that particular ballpark figure of 85%, you know, it could um, prove to be um, a little bit um, better. But again, you know, that might also be um, skewed more or less in favor of the bigger clubs who are able to earn so much more in terms of revenue. 
you could possibly have a situation where you could end up making it um, one set of, uh, I mean, one particular percentage for clubs in the upper echelon who earn more revenue, one percentage of uh, clubs, one percentage of it in uh, for, for clubs in the uh, middle tier and then lower tier, the clubs some um, fighting relegation, they can um, sort of have a little bit more leeway. So certainly clubs like um, um, Everton or what have you, which um, still can't quite get their act together, can be subject to the 85% leeway, but the 70% leeway or something more stricter would be used strictly for the top clubs. That way they wouldn't be tempted to spend too much more money. Um, we all know that they have money to burn, but they wouldn't necessarily be, be tempted to spend too much more of it, if you know what I mean. So um, I like this idea that UEFA have of a sort of a ballpark figure of a, of a percentage of how much money you can spend. But a lot, um, if you can at least um, tweak that and make that more flexible, that would be good. I think the only way a luxury tax would work is if you make that um, also a little bit more flexible. But I can't see that happening because, um, you know, taxes normally um, they preach about they, people who are responsible for, um, you know, coming up with these tax laws preach flexibility. But in practice, we all know that um, it, it hardly ever happens. So. Um, all I can say is that with regard to some of the clubs that have been badly affected, like Everton and Forest, I hope that they can somehow, you know, mend their ways and, and, and get back into um, the blue and really just um, get the club back into better financial health and at least follow the example of clubs like Bournemouth who have um, done really well. And it's amazing how a club like Arsenal under Arsene Wenger were touted as a financially feasible club. That went out the window when we spent the money we did for Meza Ozil, and the rest is history. So obviously, not every single club can afford to spend big money on players. And it just goes to show that you can't build castles in the air unless you have a solid financial footing. Yep. Completely agree with you, mate. And the thing is, is you know, and I can understand what Everton and Forest fans are probably thinking is that Manchester City is this designed for them and Chelsea because they're 115 charges? Are they not? Are they changing this rule after this season because of that? Of course, these are all things in the press. They may change. Who knows what Richard Masters has got up his sleeve next? Um, hopefully, it's a resignation because I think personally he's ran it so badly that it should be. But we shall see. Um, I guess it's a tough job keeping everybody happy. Um, but of course, it seems to be one rule for one, one rule for another at the moment, doesn't it? I agree completely, mate. And that's what makes a lot of fans and football aficionados lose faith in this whole process because you can't talk about justice and fairness unless there is uh, justice and fairness being applied to everybody. And City have been able to delay um, what could be the inevitable because they've um, launched an appeal. But, uh, you know, all we can do is just hope that the uh, wheels of justice will um, turn a little bit more quickly. And how this affects me personally, I mean, we've got a lot of fans of my club, Craig, who were talking about how this should um, end up meaning that retroactively we are awarded the uh, premiership title that we lost last season. But I'll tell you what, there'd be several fans, all of these fans who say that, uh, if you give them the option of being able to buy their way to success, they take that too, you know. And especially yeah. given the fact that it's been 20 years since we last won the Premiership, 31 years since we last won anything in Europe, and you see where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is um, something that Arsenal fans now, um, in retrospect, would be willing to have themselves. They um, speak um, gleefully about how, you know, um, the likes of Chelsea and so forth are a bunch of financial cheats who bought their way to success. But I tell you what, you put them in the same boat, they wouldn't complain. It's like it, if um, uh, if I could think of an analogy, it's as if you know a person. It's, it's as if a person um, sort of uh, mocks another guy for 
earning a good salary at another company, but not really um, doing, um, you know, what could be called acceptable work and talking about the nobility of what he's doing. But if you give him the chance uh, to earn more money, of course, he'll take it. And he can't speak afterwards because his mouth's full, having bitten off the hand of his new of his new paymaster. In the same way, if you give Arsenal fans the chance to buy their way to success, there's no way that they would complain, especially given how um, they'd be um, celebrating uh, yet another piece of silverware. And consider that Chelsea had a huge um, drought and that they hadn't won the league in about 50 years before Jose Mourinho came in, but did win quite a few pieces of, um, you know, cup silverware and European silverware. You know, it's understandable that Arsenal fans would feel the same way. And going back to your question, yes, it does look as though there is one rule for one and another rule for another. And the only way that that can change is that eventually you know, the wheels of justice will turn very quickly and City have their day in court and are made to answer for all of those charges. And we can't, you know, speculate on anything that might happen. All we can do is just wait and watch and um, maybe hope. And yet, as we all know, it's the hope that can sometimes kill us. Definitely, definitely. Well, Manny... It's been a pleasure, as always, to have you on this show. Um, no doubt we will be doing this again very, very soon. Um, and honestly, mate, as always, yeah, a real pleasure and really insightful conversation again as normal today. Thank you very much indeed, mate. And I have to say, you know, I know that there might be some people who will be listening to this on playback and saying, you know, what is this some bloke waffling about? But I do have some insights and I'd like to think that they um, add to the um, debate in that regard. Um, if I do get a chance to speak to uh, to some of the people you've interviewed, if I ever do get that lucky, you know, maybe they might... Uh, you know, consider what I'd have to say and they can be brutally honest with me. I know you'd be honest with me as well. But the fact that you keep having me on, I've missed this so much and we need to keep doing more of this. And I will say, of course, and we will, um, and I will, um, you know, button my lip after this. You picked a perfect time to do some cherry picking right when your cherries are in really, really good health. They're blossoming right now, one would say. Definitely, mate, definitely. Well, <laughs> Manny, a pleasure as always. Um, and no doubt we will catch up soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the show. Remember, hit the like, the subscribe, the bell button, leave comments below. And also, you can listen to us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else that you get your audio listening from um we are there and of course we are the afc bournemouth talk sport channel of choice so we shall see you in the next show from me and manny up the cherries we'll see you in the next one thank you for joining us cheers everyone take care